Good morning and welcome to River Church Online Worship. Thank you for inviting me into your home. We continue down this series of the Great Exchange, a walk through the stories of the Bible. We're looking at this story, the Great Exchange, and how it's found on every page of every chapter, every book in the entire Bible. The Great Exchange is this story that Jesus and me, we make a, a great exchange. He takes from me my sin and my brokenness and he, 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 he bore the penalty on the cross. He exchanges it. What I get out of the deal is the righteousness of Christ. That's the story of Christianity, the story of the gospel. The great exchange. Um, I like to tell you each and every week a little story about how I made a lesser exchange in my life. Uh, but this one actually, uh, this week it's not about me, it's about my son, my oldest son. He's an adult uh, and he, uh, he, has a, he had an old beat up pickup truck. He'd had it since his freshman year in high school. He paid for it himself. And uh, one night back in the fall, a, a norther blew through. And you know how that goes. The wind blows like 30 miles an hour and the temperature drops. And it's kind of an ugly, menacing sort of a sight when these things blow in. And so it blew in, but it blew in the middle of the night. And what happened was uh, a large, a very large tree fell on my son's truck, on Truett's truck. And it was a quite a dramatic sight and it ruined the car. I mean, they use this term totaled. It just did like a taco right in the middle of the truck. And, we, and he thought, oh no, what's gonna happen? What am I gonna do? I no longer have transportation. But he also has this beautiful thing, it's called auto insurance. So over the course of the next few days and weeks, he dealt with his insurance company. And what happened was they said, your, your truck, Mr. Caulfield, Truett Caulfield, your truck is, is what we call totaled. So we're gonna have to take that truck from you. We're gonna have to give you a check in its place. And then you can take that check and you can do whatever you want. You can go out and buy another truck. You can do whatever you don't wanna do with that money. So, so what happened was, uh, and in, fa in fact, Truett exchanged a 16 year old truck with 200,000 miles on it uh, for a check and ultimately what he got back in return in this, in this exchange, he got uh, an eight year old truck uh, with about 100,000 miles um, on it and it cost him nothing because he already had the auto insurance. And so that was the exchange that was made. Pretty good deal. The exchange we look at in the Bible, the great exchange is obviously much more significant than that. Last week in this sermon series, we talked about the curse and the cure. I'm not gonna re-preach that sermon, but it was such an important topic. I thought we gotta come back one more week and look at this, this, these two motifs or themes throughout the Bible. There's a curse and there's a cure. God offers up to us a curse, a blessing, a blessing, a curse. And, and so but what in, in, Christian, in Christian thought, what is a curse? Because we kind of think, oh, witchcraft, you know, maybe you think the Kukui or the Ojo. And if you're not from here, if you're not from the Valley, South Texas, you don't even know what I'm talking about. That's okay. But, but it's kind of a witchcraft sort of a thought. But, but is, is, is the idea of a curse found in the Bible? And I would tell you that, yeah, within Christian thought, within the Bible, it, it's there. Um, a blessing and a curse. Uh, God, throughout Scripture, uh, he puts before uh, he puts before the nation of Israel, he puts before the early church, and he puts before us today this offering. He says, I set before you today a blessing and a curse, life and death, good and evil, and you choose. Walk in my ways, the Lord says, and you will inherit a blessed life. Turn from my ways and go your own way. Live, you live your life the way, however you want to live it, and you will inherit a curse. <clears throat> God spoke those words to the Old Testament Israelites. Jesus spoke those words uh, to his, his colleagues or his followers and his, the crowd that, 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 that followed him everywhere he went uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, specifically in the Beatitudes. But Matthew chapter 5, um, he, for instance, he said, blessed are you if, blessed are you if. And he would give all these different examples. And, and one of them, you, you may be familiar with this, he said, blessed are you are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, that means the humble, the contrite, the repentant, the lowly. Jesus says, blessed are you, you will inherit the kingdom of heaven. So, so throughout the Bible, there's just the, a blessing and curse, you, you choose. So I was, I was driving back from the airport a few days ago, my my wife and uh, Emma, our 17-year-old daughter, went to 
Kansas City to see Alyssa. They came back. I picked them up at the airport. We were driving home late one night, and, and they asked me, hey, hey, uh, what about your sermon? How'd Sunday go? And, and I said, well, I preached, I preached, this was last week, I preached um, on God taking a curse and turning it into a cure, a blessing in the life of, of his children, taking a curse and turning it into a blessing. And the immediate question was, well, what is a curse? Well, what does that mean from a biblical standpoint? What is a curse? And I think, wow, that'd be a helpful topic. We should continue this, uh, this thought one more week. And so that's what we're doing. Today we're in the book of Deuteronomy. It's the fifth book in the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And let's talk about that. Like from the, the Hebrews' perspective, the, the people in, in Deuteronomy, God's chosen people, they're wandering in the wilderness they just got pulled out of slavery and now God is blessing them. He's giving them food to eat and, and he's making sure that their sandals don't wear out while they're wandering around in the wilderness. There's some, all these miraculous things are happening to them. And, and their perspective, because he says, I, I put before you today a blessing and a curse. He, uh, Jesus says to his followers of the day, I put before you a blessing and a curse. I believe God says to us today uh, in 2021, I put before you a blessing and a curse you choose. But, but way back there uh, in Deuteronomy, what did the Hebrew people think about a blessing and a curse? Well, here's the fact. Uh, they valued more than anything else, they valued the smile of the Lord, the, 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 the blessing of the Lord, the favor of God. They, they valued that more than monetary uh, gain, uh, more than health, more than anything. The, the, the blessing of the Lord. Now, now, often in their day and age, the monetary gain and, and in health was wrapped up in the blessing, the smile, the ultimate smile of God. That was the ultimate blessing for the Jewish people. They would say things like this. We're going to go to Numbers before we get to Deuteronomy. Number six, the Lord bless you and keep you. This was a blessing that they would speak over one another all the time. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Oh, and that was, that was the, the, the Hebrews' ultimate hope, uh, that the Lord would show them, 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 them blessings and, and his face would shine on them and he'd be gracious toward them and give them peace and and the, the Jews' ultimate hope was the same hope that we, as Christ followers, are promised in the New Testament. John, 1 John chapter 3 says, Beloved, we are, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. The blessing for us as New Testament Christians, the blessing is we're adopted and we're, we're uh, well-loved children of the Lord. And, and one day, we're going to see him face to face. Now, there is a shift in scope. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, there's a, a shift in the scope and the nature of the smile of God. Let me say that again. There is a shift in the scope and the nature of the smile of the Lord from the Old Testament to the New, New Testament. Uh, in the Old Testament, the smile of God meant your health. Your kids won't get sick. Your sandals won't wear out and your sheep won't die and, 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 and your wife will be healthy in her old age. And, but, but in the New Testament, uh, the, Jesus speaks of the smile of the Lord, the, the, the blessing um, in a, in a slightly different way, the scope, the nature of it. And I'll go back to the Sermon on the Mount that we might uh, talk about this. And this is important because you've probably heard preaching that say that, you know, if you, if you follow Jesus, then you'll, you'll receive health and wealth and, and, and your wells won't run dry and, you know, your, your crops won't die. And, and I'm just telling you that, 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 that the, the nature and the scope of the blessing of the Lord, it, it, it shifts somewhat in, in the teachings of Jesus. The smile of the Lord, the blessing of the Lord, it's, it's there. It, it's for our uh, receiving, uh, but it's expanded. The, the nature and scope, it's way beyond just monetary stuff. It's way more significant than that. 
What does Jesus promise in the Beatitudes? You can go back and look at it, but I'll give you a quick list. Uh, you'll inherit the kingdom of heaven. You'll inherit the earth. I, I don't even know quite what that means, but that just sounds awesome, right? Uh, you inherit the kingdom of heaven. Inherit the, king, uh, the, the, the earth. You'll be comforted. You'll be satisfied. You'll be shown mercy. You will, you will get to see the Lord. And the last one, as I see it, is God will call you son, daughter, child. And then, and then that section of Scripture wraps up with this. Verse 11, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. What Jesus makes clear is on this earth, in this world, again, there's a kind of a shifting of the scope of the blessing. In this world, um, you, you may be reviled and, 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 and persecuted and, and, and hated because you're my follower, but take heart. Take heart, I've overcome the world, and you'll be blessed because your reward is great great in heaven. And he also speaks of, of rewards here on earth, satisfaction, comfort, mercy. There's another word throughout the Bible that describes the blessing of the word. I'm going to throw it in now, and that is rest. Because all that I'm speaking of, mercy and satisfaction and comfort, all just, just rest, deep soul rest. We're going to come back to that, but let's Continue on for just a moment on this, this, this idea of the blessing, the smile of God. It's much different and much more than just cars and houses and watches and earthly wealth. If you think that's all there is to the blessing of the Lord, then you're selling the Lord short. What is the curse, however? That's really the question that my wife and daughter asked on the drive home that night. What is the curse? And the curse is actually the polar opposite of the blessing. Imagine, uh, I'm going to read you something that R.C. Sproul wrote uh, several years ago. Uh, imagine the opposite of Numbers chapter 6. It might go something like this. May the Lord curse and abandon you. May the Lord keep you in darkness and give you only judgment without grace. May the Lord turn his back on you and remove his peace from you forever. While well, the Lord says, I, I put before you today a, a blessing and a curse, life and death, good and evil, you choose. How might we access that blessing? Well, here's how we access it. Jesus has taken our place in this judgment, in this curse. He took the curse on himself that we might not have to because he was able to absorb all the wrath of God, all the righteous anger of God toward, uh, toward our sin. On the cross, Jesus absorbed that. And what's the last thing he, he said on the cross? He said, it's done. It's finished. It's completed. Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming cursed for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. That's us. So that so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. What is the curse in the Bible? It's God removing his peace forever. It's us not finding rest in the Lord ever. Think about the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden. When, when God removed his hand of blessing, life got really hard and, and there was striving and there was always striving in, in, in the curse of the Garden of Eden. Uh, that, in the Garden of Eden, that was the curse. You're going to strive, you're going to try, you're going to work real hard, and you're going to fail. God's peace is removed. Sadly, this is how most Americans, uh, most Westerners, we, we live our lives every day, a cursed sort of a life. It's become a way of life. And if you join that party, then you're cursed too. Um, it's how the modern day man and woman lives. Um, most people in the first world, modern, developed, educated countries, 
uh, in today's context are living in a curse. That means the curse of striving. Not happy, not comforted, not satisfied, few if any friends, no community, fewer family members that care. We're striving. We're, we're striving. We will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. We will not inherit the earth. We will be no peace or satisfaction. We're not going to be showing mercy to one another. We're not going to be shown mercy, not being comforted, not comforting anyone. Living a cursed life. And God enters into that world, into our space, and he offers a blessing. I offer to you today, today a blessing and a curse. And do you know the way in which God packages this said blessing, how he describes it? In the form of rest. In the form of Sabbath rest. In the form of taking a regimented amount of time each and every week and being quiet. Slowing down. Resting. Now hear me. Hear me. That is why God begins his, when he gives his pep talk to the Israelites about taking a Sabbath rest, he begins there, he always ends with, hey, remember, you formerly were slaves in Egypt, and I delivered you out of slavery, therefore, take a break, rest. Now, what's the correlation? Why does he do that? Why, I, I'm, I'm going to show you here in a minute, but why does he always start with, with a pep talk? You need to take a break, take a Sabbath rest. You can, you can afford to, to take it the day off, and you won't run out. Uh, I, I, I've provided for you all these 40 years in the wilderness. I'll continue to take your kids to church. You can take, take, go to the beach and go on a walk with your wife. You don't have to strive. You don't have to work for all that you can get. Uh, remember Jesus' words, come to me all who, are lab who, all who labor and I will give you rest. God is saying, God is saying, look, you were once slaves, literally, in, in, to, to the Israelites, and I delivered you from that slavery, and you had nothing. I took you out into the wilderness. I miraculously provided for you. I've given you wealth and health and everything you've needed over these last 40 years. You can trust that, that it's not your ability to work hard that is provided for your needs. I, the Lord, have and will continue to provide you can see it right here in De Deuteronomy chapter 5. It says this, Observe the Sabbath day. That meant they were to take one day of rest, no work, each seven days. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day it's the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter... Your male servants, your female servant, your ox, your donkey, your livestock. Going on to verse 15. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. There it is. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So what is the correlation between resting one day a week and the fact that, hey, you were formerly slaves, don't forget that. Well, let me ask you a personal question. Why is it that we find it so hard to rest? And I'd say it's at least one of two things. Number one, my identity is wrapped up in my product productivity, Pastor Randy. When I don't work, I, I just feel like junk, like I, my, I, my value is in what I am able to produce. And maybe number two, you would say, I think if I don't work all the time and strive hard, I will run out. Everybody else is going to get ahead. I'm going to fall behind. And into that frantic sort of lifestyle, what I call a cursed life, the Lord has always invited us to, to trade in your striving for my blessing. Trade in your striving you're working so hard for my blessing. Choose you this day a blessing or a curse. And the, and the blessing of the Lord, my friends, can be so wrapped up in the word rest. In fact, eternal rest. Because the Lord provides. The, the Lord is saying to his children, you can rest once a week and I will provide. 
You can live on 90% of your earnings or 80 or 70% of your earnings and I will provide. The Lord says you, you can lend to those in need without worrying because I will provide. The Lord says you can be generous to others and I, the Lord, will provide. Many of you watching, many of those who will be in this room worshiping later on today would say, the one... I don't believe that I can live better by working less. Like, well, that just doesn't happen. It just, that's just not how life works. I don't, I don't believe I can live better by, by working less. Number two, um, if I'm generous with my money, I'm honestly convinced that I'm going to run out. I mean, I'd love to support the church. I'd love to support missionaries. I would love to give to those in need, but I just... I, I, I'm going to run out. And, and, and I think the third thing we'd say is, look, I dare not be merciful toward my competitors, my, my, my business competitors, my, my enemies. I, I dare not be merciful toward them, else I'll get taken advantage of. I'll get taken to the cleaners. I will lose. Well, in, in, the, in, in the nation of Israel's history, when they were wandering in the wilderness, God gave them some instructions that they were to abide by that were rather unusual. They were kind of weird. Rules, rituals. For instance, he told them, number one, you're going to rest one day a week. Mandatory. Don't do anything. Don't even bake the lasagna. Number two, every seventh year, you're going to let your fields rest. You know, the, the, the grain is just going to fall to the ground and you're not going to harvest it. The grapes are going to fall to the ground and you're not going to, going to harvest them and make wine. You're just going to let the field rest. Now, I live out in, in, in Bayview, and Lydia and I watched, you know, that fateful night. It was Valentine's, oddly. Valentine's night, when we had that really, really hard cold snap, and, and our grapefruit trees, the, all the leaves blew off, and the, the uh, fruit fell to the ground. And we got some farmers out there that just lost lots of citrus, and you just, you just oh, it's just painful. All the lost money. Well, God tells the nation of Israel... Uh, every seventh year, you're just going to let it all fall to the ground. You're not going to worry about it because I will provide. Not only that, every seventh year, you're going to cancel all your money debts, all your monetary debts. And then get this, every 49th year, you're going to return all the property that you have to its original family owners. Everybody's going to start all over. It's gonna, we're going to hit the reset button. Everybody gets all their old family property back. And we're just start all over again. And what God is doing, he's asking, do you trust that you can rely on my provision rather than striving yourself. And boy, that's a message to this day that we really wrestle with. Deuteronomy 7, tenderly God says to his people, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you. He's chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples, who are on the face of the earth. And they, they, they must have asked, why did you choose us, God? Why did you choose us? Because he answers. In verse 7, he says, It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. And, and the implication really here in Deuteronomy 7 is this. You're not all that. You're not the most beautiful people. You're not the largest tribe. You're not, you're not useful to me in the sense that you're, you've got great capacity. Um, the Lord doesn't love you because you're great and capable and hardworking and successful. No. No, he simply chooses to love you. He loves you because he loves you. He loves you because he chooses to love you. And he will provide, not because you're great, not because you're capable, but because he loves you. So I would say to you, my friends, in 2021, you, you want to be great? Don't strive, but trust. Don't strive, but rest in the Lord. Deuteronomy 11, the Lord says, See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. You choose. You choose the course of your life from here on out. Are you striving today, my friends? Trade in the, the, the great exchange. Trade in 
You're striving for God's blessing. Sadly, some of you today, you're choosing to live a cursed life. And you're afraid, like you got something to lose. You're, you're afraid to trade in that cursed life. And, and, and the Lord says, trade it in. May the smile of the Lord be on your face. May the wind of his approval always be blowing at your back. Look, I, I know you probably think, well, boy, I'm scared. If I, you know, if I, were, if I were to do that, uh, stop all my striving, then I might, I might have less. I might not be able to go on vacations. Or might, you know, I got a good friend that, that, that just a few years ago, he said, you know what? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trade in my striving for the Lord's blessing. And I have to tell you, in the course of the last 10 years, he has traveled more internationally. He's, he's got the, the, the dream job that he used to dream of having. His precious wife and his kids, they, they live in a nice home, and they're, they're totally satisfied in the Lord. He used to really strive, but now he is resting in the Lord. So what do you got to lose? A, a, a cursed life, that's what it is. I invite you today to tell the Lord, tell him, I want to, start, I want to stop striving and I want to start resting in you. In fact, now's a good time for you to pray. You can close your eyes, you can pray with your, with your eyes open, that's, that's allowed. Um, just say, I... All this striving, it's just, it's not working for me. I want to rest in you, Lord. I want to trust in you. I want to follow your ways. Uh, I, I, I think I can live, God, I think I can live better with the day of rest. I think I can live better with a generous, generous approach to my money. I think I can live better with a, a merciful attitude toward my enemies. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord you, you're choosing the blessing, not the curse. Now, maybe you're the kind of person that would say, you know, I feel like my life is cursed. Well, well the Lord, he invites you today. He says, I, I set before you today a blessing. T today is a new day, a new start. A new opportunity. Jesus himself says, Come to me, all you who labor and are weary, and I will give you rest. It's time for a new start. Why live like the rest of the world, a cursed life? Today's a new day. I invite you to come to Jesus, my friends. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, that's a wrap. That's it for, for today. Uh, you know, you're still self-isolating. You're still at home. And I totally understand that. I totally respect that. Boy, I'm starting to feel like maybe there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe a new day, or not maybe, a new day is ahead of us. It's, it's coming. It's fast approaching. I, I believe it is. I look forward to the day when all these chairs are are, are filled and we're not, we're not, iso, we're not uh, social distancing and and when I, I can give you a big hug. I look forward to that. I, I, I see that day coming soon. But, but for now, well, I just, I'm honored that you've invited me to your home. Look, uh, if you have anything that uh, you, you need to get off your chest, maybe a prayer request, uh, maybe a need, and you just need the elders to know about it, send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, and we will pray for you and we will do whatever we can to, to serve you and meet your needs. Um, maybe you just have some questions about River Church. You can go to our website, uh, riverchurchrgv.com. All things River Church can be found there. Maybe you want to get connected, even virtually. We have some online Bible studies and prayer groups. Send us an email and we'll get you connected. Now would be a good time to go to the website and, and give. Everything that we do here at River Church is funded by your good gifts. It used to be that, that many of you gave in the, the offering basket, and some of you still do, but now, thankfully, many of you have, have, have turned to online giving. You go to the website, you click that Give button, and, and it's safe and intuitive and, and fun. And, and, and so I thank you, those of you that have been giving generously over the last year, and I encourage the rest of you, all of us, we need to go online right now and, and give to, to, to the work of the church. Um, well, I think, that, I think that's it. Uh, again, I, I, 
I want the best for you. I'm, I'm, I'm praying for you. If, you. if you have anything that you, you, you need, let me know. Send me an email. Enjoy the rest of your day, guys. Love you.